a quiet street in an Argentinian coastal resort. Nothing out of the ordinary. But early in 1998, the peaceful atmosphere is suddenly shattered as the world's press descends on the home of a 77-year-old Croatian called Dinko Sakic. An Argentinian police car takes Dinko Sakic on the first leg of a journey that will end in a courtroom back in his homeland, 6,000 miles away. The crimes for which Sakic now faces trial were committed more than half a century earlier, during World War II. At the time, Croatia was an ally of the Nazis, and its leader, Ant Pavelic, modeled himself on Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. As the war unfolded, Croatia was sucked into collaboration. And Dinko Sakic ended up as the commandant of one of the most notorious death camps of World War II, Yasenovac. Yasenovac became known as the Auschwitz of the Balkans. Here, Sakic carried out acts of torture and mass murder in the name of the Croatian people. Now, after more than 50 years on the run, Justice has finally caught up with Dinko Sakic. But in his homeland, his case raised old and deep divisions. Dinko Sakic may be the man facing trial, but the horrifying deeds that he stands accused of cast a stain not only on the newly created country of Croatia, but also on the Roman Catholic Church. Can collaborating with the Nazis ever be justified in the name of freedom? And was Dinko Sakic an honorable freedom fighter or a sadistic war criminal? Mire, no hablo lo que era antes ni lo que era después. Pero mientras yo estaba, nadie podía tocar. Nadie podía tocar a nadie. November 1918, the end of World War I, and just three years before the birth of Dinko Sakic. Victorious Serbian troops make their way back to their capital, Belgrade. King Alexander of Serbia becomes the head of a new kingdom created out of the ruins of war. But it's a kingdom that is both complex and turbulent. As well as his own people, the Serbs, he was ruling over the Croats, the people of Slovenia, Bosnians, Kosovo Albanians, the people of Macedonia and Montenegro. These people had different religions, different histories, different cultures, and even different languages. It was a dangerous and volatile mixture. King Alexander had to rule these disparate lands with a firm hand. He suppressed regional loyalties. Politicians hostile to the monarchy were sidelined, sometimes even imprisoned. In 1929, Alexander gave a new name to his kingdom. He called it Yugoslavia, the land of the Southern Slavs. He then cracked down hard on political parties who opposed him, including a rising Croat nationalist called Ant Pavelic. Pavelic's brand of fiery nationalism places him in the forefront of Croatian politics. But Alexander's crackdown now forced him and his followers to flee to neighboring Italy. Deve cristallizzare una posizione di potente ingiustizia perché ha dato la fiamma il sangue. Italy's leader was Benito Mussolini, then at the height of his power and popularity. Mussolini formed his fascist party after World War I by exploiting the grievances of soldiers returning from the front, only to find mass unemployment. He organized them into armed squads known as the Black Shirts, who terrorized their political opponents. In 1922, 
Mussolini became Prime Minister of Italy. By the end of the decade, he had become dictator and set about re-establishing his country as a great European power. Mussolini suspended civil liberties and destroyed all opposition, all tactics that appealed to Pavelich. In 1935, he invaded Ethiopia and absorbed it into what he referred to as his new Italian Empire. He also provided military support to General Franco in the Spanish Civil War. Later, influenced by Adolf Hitler, Mussolini began to introduce anti-Jewish legislation into Italy. This was the perfect environment for Ant Pavelich to establish his own fascist movement. He called it the Ustasha. The word in Serbo-Croat means insurgent. For his part, Mussolini saw the Ustasha movement as a means to break up the Kingdom of Yugoslavia and to expand Italian influence in the Balkans. He placed money and weapons at Pavelic's disposal. Then, in October 1934, the Ustasha made their move. A hit squad was organized to attack their enemy, King Alexander. But they'd have to wait for their opportunity. It came when Alexander went to Marseille in the south of France on a state visit. The king and his French guests were greeted by the people of the city, completely unaware that fascist terrorists had infiltrated the crowd. of Yugoslavia is to be born through the city streets. The grief-stricken Queen Maria walks with her little son, King Peter. Behind them come notabilities of every country in Europe. Yugoslavia had lost its strongman. Alexander's heir, Peter, was just a boy, too young and too weak to unite a country. For his involvement in Alexander's assassination, a French court sentenced Pavelic to death in his absence. But safe under Mussolini's protection, Pavelic and the Eustacia movement continue to thrive. And we must fest zusammenstehen für dieses Deutschland. Sieg heil! By now, and Pavelic had another potential ally, Adolf Hitler, the dictator of Nazi Germany. In the late 1930s, Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini came together to form what became known as the Pact of Steel. Their alliance gave great hope to right-wing nationalists throughout Europe. Pavelic believed Italian fascism and German Nazism to be the wave of the future and the means by which Croatia would regain its freedom. His dream was of an independent Croatian state entirely free of foreigners like Serbs and Jews. It was extraordinarily attractive to many Croats, especially to a young man like Dinko Sakic. Fired up by Croatian nationalist zeal, Sakic was ready for action. It wasn't long in coming. April the 8th, 1941, war came to Yugoslavia. In the previous 18 months, Nazi Germany had conquered Poland, most of Scandinavia, and the whole of Western Europe. Now, it was Yugoslavia's turn.
The Yugoslav army quickly collapsed, and in just 11 days the fighting was over, and the Yugoslav monarchy fled. Hier werden unsere Soldaten mit jubelnder Begeisterung als Befreier begrüßt. But in some parts of Yugoslavia, German troops were greeted as liberators. The arrival of German and Italian soldiers now allowed the underground Ustasha movement to seize power in the Croat capital, Zagreb. The local population, Croats, I would say, many of them were happy when this uh, state of Yugoslavia collapsed because they were not happy in that semi-democratic regime, terror, repression. People were thinking that the, the war is over, but it was, of course, it, it wasn't. The catastrophe, the tragedy then started. Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. Pavlic returned from his exile in Italy and declared an independent Croat state. Backed by fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, Pavlic's new state consisted not only of traditionally Croat lands, but the whole of Bosnia. A substantial Serb minority now found itself living under Ustasha rule. Martial law was introduced the second day, racial laws, um, only after 15 days. First, anti-Serbian measures also in the first days. Mass killings took, took place already at the beginning of May. That means 20 days after the creation of the government. They were very, very, very fast. But there was one major difference between Pavlic's brand of fascism and that of the Nazis. Whereas the Nazis largely despised religion, Pavlic's regime was staunchly Roman Catholic. And Pavlic wanted to create an exclusively Catholic state and cleanse his native land of all alien elements. They had this strategy of, of the thirds, that means one third of the Serbs should be killed, one third of the Serbs should be sent to Serbia, and one third should become Catholics. And if they become Catholics, then they become Croats, and that's how he thought that he will uh, resolve so-called resol uh, solution of the Serbian, Serbian question. In one of the blacker moments of the Catholic Church's 20th century history, the country's leading cleric, Archbishop Stepanich, gave the regime his blessing. Much of the Catholic Church became an active partner in the forced conversion of the traditionally Christian Orthodox Serbs to Catholicism. Croat fascism and the Catholic Church would remain uncomfortably entwined for the rest of the war. The position of the Catholic Church in the Second World War is, of course, uh, full of controversies. When the first uh, Ustasha crimes uh, happened and they saw what was going on, the Church was never uh, united in the attitude. Some of them cooperated with the Ushasha, and some of them even committed crimes. Pavlic now unleashed a reign of terror on the Serb minority living within Croatia. Tens of thousands of them were expelled, killed, or imprisoned.
anti-fascist Croats were also jailed. Bowing to German wishes, the Ustasha targeted gypsies and Jews as well. Their persecution of the Jews became an excuse for organized theft on a massive scale. As they were rounded up, Jews were stripped of all their possessions, down to the wedding rings on their fingers. By July 1941, the country's prisons could no longer cope with the flood of new inmates. That summer, the Ustasha embarked on the construction of what would become some of the biggest and most horrific concentration camps in Europe. Dinko Sakic, now 21, seized his moment to join the cause and signed up to be a camp guard. Over the next few years, he would rise through the ranks to become what many allege was one of the most brutal, if little known, Nazi collaborators of World War II. Sakic's first job was at Yesenovats, just an hour's drive from the capital, Zagreb. At Yesenovats, a number of separate camps were built on the banks of the Sava River. The complex housed the largest number of prison inmates in the whole of Croatia. Today at the Yesenovats site, memorials and sculptures stand as a reminder of those that suffered and died here. The mastermind behind the camp was Max Luburic, head of Pavlic's newly formed special police force and overall commander of the Ustasha's concentration camp program. In 1943, Dinko Sakic married Max Luburic's half-sister Nada, a guard at one of the women's camps at Yesenovats. It was a move that secured a place in Luburic's inner circle. Then, at the age of 24, Sakic was appointed camp commandant. Luburic was a very important person, and he, of course, wanted to have in Yasenovac a person who is 100% loyal to him, and Dinko Sakic uh, definitely was the person of that kind. He would be much more than a mere administrator. His main concern would soon turn to extermination. Luburic began to draw up plans for Yesenovats after visiting Nazi concentration camps. Yesenovats and other camps in Croatia were modeled on the design and style of the German ones. Luburic had also observed the Nazis' latest experiments in mass murder, gas chambers, in which men, women, and children were suffocated with carbon monoxide from motor vehicles. But the guards at Yesenovats preferred altogether simpler methods of killing. The Yesenovats Memorial Museum in Croatia shows some of the gruesome artifacts from the original site. The displays include the Ustasha Guard's weapons of choice. One fearsome implement was a special blade known as the Serb Cutter. It was devised to slit people's throats quickly and easily. One guard later boasted that he had slit the throats of some 1,300 prisoners with his Serb Cutter. Inmates were also thrown into the ovens of a brick factory inside one of the camps at Yesenovats and burnt alive. Very few of those who survived Yesenovats are still alive to tell of their experiences. Pava Molna was 20 years old when the Germans invaded and the independent state of Croatia was established. She was an active member of Zagreb's communist youth movement 
and was quickly arrested and sent to Yasenovac. Srpkinje i Hrva iz Židovke su otišle u Kulu. U Kulu je bila najobična voda ili je bila pokvareni luk u vodi ili kupus. To je bilo osuđeno na smrt. Takve štakore sigurno niko nije video. To su ko mačke velike štakore. One su jednostavno plazile po ljudima, grizle uši, dok jednostavno se one nisu mogli braniti. Ja sam videla recimo kamion sa ustašama, sa lopatama i žene idu gore na kamion, a one viću, viću, a gde su naše stvari? A oni kažu, doći će za vama. Dvi drugi dan te nismo videli. Prema tome, te masu ti žena morali su nestati. A gde su nestali, negdje su ubijene. By now, the Nazis were progressing with their program of extermination, gassing hundreds of thousands of Jews. Their death camps saw human suffering on a vast, unimaginable scale. Although it hardly seems possible, the killing techniques employed by the Ustasha in Croatia were even more sadistic. The regime at Jesenovac was so violent and brutal, it disturbed even the Nazis. Heinrich Himmler, head of the German SS, regularly received reports from German eyewitnesses in Croatia. One of them recorded in 1942. The Ustasha committed their deeds in a bestial manner, not only against males of conscript age, but especially against helpless old people, women and children. The number of the Orthodox that the Croats have massacred and sadistically tortured to death is about 300,000. Ja sam videla kad su došli recimo žene iz iz Kostajnice, pa smo mi morali Hrvatice njih pregledavati, jer Ustaša stoji i gleda i mi njima šapćemo, mi smo isto što i vi, predajte što imate. Naravno, slušajte, ako neko ima u šavu ili u gumbu za, za, za ne znam, sačuvao koji, koji dola. Ustaša je za nama išao, Pregledao ih je, one se poplašile, one su sve počele bacati one novce koje su imali. On je postrojio njih deset i odmah je postrojio. To je ono što smo mi videli. Eventually, the Ustasha became worried about the stories of torture and mass murder at Jesenovac. To put an end to the gossip, the Pavlic regime commissioned a series of photographs. They showed inmates in the camp doing useful work for the war effort. But beyond the reach of the camera lens, the cruelty and mass murder continued without let up. When the colonies from Kozarash came to the children, they took the children from the mother. They were little children, neka tek rođena, neke, neke do 15 godina, oni su ih odvajali e, ta, i to nije bilo u kuli, jer nije bilo mjesta u kuli, to je van kule bilo. Oni su tu, e, to je krik, ja mislim da je cijela, cijela gradiška od tih jauka, od te djece e, vriskali. To je ono što se ne može, to se ne može oprostiti. To je strašno. Onda su ta djeca na koncu sva u jednom posebnom zgradu bili. Neke naše Hrvatice su oko njih malo vodile računa. Naravno da su sve to od proliva, od tifusa, od gladi, sve to umrlo.
But even as the brutality at Yasenovats continued, underground resistance movements began to spring up throughout Yugoslavia. By the end of 1942, the Pavlic regime, together with its German and Italian allies, had its hands full, fighting the growing number of partisans resisting fascist occupation. Led by Croat communist leader Joseph Broz Tito and supplied and trained by the British and the Americans, this guerrilla army now presented a mortal threat to the Pavlic regime. Tito's partisans came into the middle of the conflict offering something what they called brotherhood and unity. We want to win the war against the Nazis, fascists, and the collaborators. We are offering a solution. The war against the partisans was fought without pity. Hundreds of thousands of civilians as well as partisans were killed. However, the guerrilla army managed to hold out. And time was running out for Dinko Sakic and his fellow Ustasha killers at the Yasenovats concentration camp. In the autumn of 1944, the Russian army continued its westward drive into Europe by advancing deep into the Balkans. By October, Soviet troops had linked up with Tito's partisans, and together they liberated the Yugoslav capital, Belgrade. The Croatian puppet state was now under serious threat. Dinko Sakic was ordered to kill all the survivors at Yasenovats and obliterate the evidence. Sakic ordered his men to carry out what became known as the Autumn Liquidation. For 20 days, they selected the sick and the old among the prisoners and executed them. Afterwards, they threw their bodies into the Sava River. In April 1945, Tito's partisans arrived at Yasenovats. They found nothing but ruins, rotting bodies, and huge piles of clothing stolen from the dead. Investigations began into just how many people had died at Yasenovats at the hands of Dinko Sakic and his Ustasha comrades in the previous four years. But in the absence of documents which had all been destroyed, no reliable figure was ever produced. Historians now believe that an estimated one million Yugoslav citizens perished between 1941 and 1945. It's thought that one third of these, over 300,000, died at Yasenovats. In 1945, the Germans surrendered to the victorious allies, and the independent state of Croatia collapsed like a pack of cards. Thousands of Ustasha members fled alongside German troops and found refuge in prison camps run by the British in neighboring Italy and Austria. The British were ignorant of Croatian involvement in Nazi crimes, so they made little effort to look for Pavlic 
and his closest Ustasha comrades. Dinko Sakic was one of those who evaded the roundup. Some now believe that his escape was aided by members of the Roman Catholic Church. It's thought they received help from a senior member of the Catholic Church, closely linked to the Vatican. With money and false papers supplied by this Catholic rat line, they were able to seek a new life abroad, with South America as one of the most popular destinations. Zagreb, 1946. The Catholic Church found itself on trial for its support of the Ustasha regime. Unable to catch any of the key players, such as Pavelic, Luburic, or Sakic, the communist government of Joseph Tito put Archbishop Stepanich in the dock. He was tried for collaboration with the Ustasha and for permitting the forcible conversion of Serbs from Orthodox Christianity to Catholicism. Stepanich was found guilty of treason and war crimes. It was a verdict that usually meant the death penalty, but Stepanich got off with just 16 years. Amazingly, after just five years behind bars, he was released. Then in 1998, in a move that polarized public opinion, not only in Croatia, but in the wider world, Pope John Paul II declared Archbishop Stepanich a martyr, and he was beatified, a major step towards becoming a saint. And at the same time, there was more bad news for the Catholic Church. A secret document released by the US Treasury Department revealed that for the previous 50 years, the Vatican had held on to some 200 million Swiss francs, plundered from Serbs, and Jews by the Ustasha. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dinko Sakic was enjoying the hospitality of Argentina's president, Colonel Juan Perón. Perón was a charismatic leader who had admired right-wing European dictators and even styled himself on them. He regarded men like Sakic and Pavelic as heroes in the struggle against godless communism and welcomed them with open arms. Benefiting from Argentine government protection, Sakic and his wife Nada settled down in the South Atlantic coastal resort of Santa Teresita, just outside Buenos Aires, and there raised a family. Sakic lived quietly in Argentina under the name Lubomir Sakic Belanovic and set up a textile factory. He remained active in Ustasha emigre politics, and so did his former wartime chief and Pavelic. Then in 1958, Pavelic made a rare appearance on television justifying his past as Croatia's wartime fascist dictator. A year later, Pavelic was murdered, the victim of an assassin working for Tito's secret police. But Dinko Sakic stayed safely in the shadows. Then, after almost half a century's exile in Argentina, the past began to catch up with him. In 1990, Croatian independence raised its head yet again. Ten years earlier, President Tito had died, and although he'd managed to keep his beloved Yugoslavia together, now it was about to break apart. 
Croats voiced their desire for independence once more. Their newly elected leader, Franjo Tuđman, had always been a loyal supporter of Tito. But as Yugoslavia began to implode, Tuđman took up the cause of Croatian nationalism. This was the cue for civil war to break out. The Serbs, who had not forgotten the crimes committed by the Ustasha against them, went to war against the Croats. And so began a new war in the Balkans, a war that would last for most of the 1990s and would involve all of the peoples of the former Yugoslavia. As hundreds of thousands of people were massacred or forced to flee from their homes, a new phrase entered modern political vocabulary, ethnic cleansing. But for men like Dinko Sakic, ethnic cleansing was nothing new. That had been their task at Yasenovac. With renewed interest in Croatia's violent history, journalists in Argentina and abroad began to seek out Dinko Sakic to hear his views. In 1998, 50 years after fleeing Croatia with his wife Nada, Dinko Sakic made a serious error of judgment. One day, a reporter from Argentinian TV program Telenoche knocked on his door requesting an interview. Sakic agreed and invited him in. Hardly able to believe his luck, the TV reporter wanted to gain Sakic's trust, so his first question was intended to make Sakic feel at ease. Yo vine a la Argentina el día 22 de diciembre de 1947 por la mañana. ¿Y en qué circunstancias? ¿Cómo, cómo como se inmigrante, como inmigrante, porque pasamos un grupo de croata, como 500 croatas llegaron con una visa múltiple que el gobierno argentino en el primer momento otorgó para emigrados croatas. Teníamos documentos, yo tenía ya obtenido antes la visa de inmigración y vinimos con el, como 150, un grupo de 150 con el buque Tucumán. The TV reporter now began to probe a little deeper into Sakic's past. Soy patriota croata que lucha por mi pueblo. Y así, así yo ya empecé. Entonces, era el hombre de confianza. Usted estuvo en Jacenova también. ¿Cómo? Usted estuvo en Jacenova también. Para decir, sí, por ahí sí estaba en la, una unidad. Allá. Dinko Sakic was uncomfortable owning up to being at Yasenovac, but the TV reporter persisted. Usted fue comandante del campo al final. No, fue director, director. no comandante. Fue director. nombrado, fue 100 días nomás. Mire, durante donde, cuando yo estaba, no había ningún guardia ni ningún administrativo que podría tocarle a un prisionero de cualquier Sea judío. Recuérdeme las fechas. Esto fue entre el 41 y el 44. 42. Entró. En diciembre 42 y octubre de 44. En esa época no, no se podía tocar a, a los prisioneros. Yo, don, mire, no hablo lo que era antes ni lo que era después. Pero mientras yo estaba, nadie podía tocar. Nadie podía tocar a nadie. Ellos tenían sus normas internas y si alguno ha hecho algo, entonces la administración interna 
lo castigaba con lo que sea. El, y entre no, fines del 42 y fines del 44 no, no se mató a nadie. No hubo, yo no vi no hubo... ni se mató. Que nosotros no teníamos interés matar a la gente. Teníamos, necesitábamos a gente para trabajar, para abastecernos. When the Telenoche interview was shown on Argentinian television, it created a sensation. Dinko Sakic had finally stepped out of the shadows into the full glare of publicity. And the consequences for him would be disastrous. Efraim Zurov, one of the most senior Nazi hunters at the Simon Wiesenthal Center, got to hear about Sakic's TV appearance. He immediately set about securing his extradition to stand trial. In the Croatian capital of Zagreb, the reaction to Sakic's public reappearance placed President Tudjman in a dilemma. Tudjman saw himself as a Croatian patriot, proud of his country's wartime history. He had used it to help rebuild his country. He had even argued that the death toll at Jesenovac had been inflated. According to Tudjman's version of history, Sakic was a freedom fighter and an honorable Croat patriot. But in the mid-1990s, Tudjman needed to demonstrate to the world, especially to the United States, that Croatia was a modern, pro-Western democracy. Americans in particular regarded Sakic as a Nazi collaborator and sadistic killer, one of the last living commandants of a World War II death camp. Within weeks of the Telenoche interview, Dinko Sakic was arrested. The media descended on the quiet neighborhood. In similar cases, the Argentinian authorities had reacted very slowly to calls from abroad for the arrest and repatriation of old Nazi war criminals. But this time, the response was different. Are you a killer, Mr. Sakic? Dinko Sakic was soon on his way back to Croatia to face justice at last. I think that it's fair to say that this could be an important milestone for Croatian society. This trial will be a litmus test for the new Croatia, for the country which seeks to fully integrate itself into the West. We should be thinking of the victims of the Ustasha regime, anti-fascist Croats, Serbs, Jews, and Gypsies. They are the ones who deserve our sympathy and our empathy. On June the 18th, 1998, Dinko Sakic arrived back in Croatia for the first time since the end of World War II. His wife, Nada, came with him. She too had served at Yesenovac, specifically in the women's camp. She was therefore implicated in war crimes and now faced interrogation by the authorities. She was deeply involved in that, ma in that manner that she knew what was going on, that she saw people who were persecuted and killed she cannot say that it didn't happen. Dinko Sakic's trial finally opened in November 1998 at the Zagreb District Court. He was charged with the deaths of thousands of prisoners while he had been the commandant at Yesenovac. More than 30 witnesses, including camp survivors, testified against him. However, throughout the trial, Sakic maintained his innocence. The professor of Croatian contemporary history at Zagreb University, Dr. Ivo Goldstein, was called as an expert witness. When I was speaking, he was laughing when I was speaking about the Ustasha system of terror, but he was laughing when some other witnesses were speaking as well, so it was not uh, uh, nothing new. The judge was warning him a couple of times, uh, Mr. Shakic, don't laugh, don't laugh, it's not funny, don't laugh. And he was laughing again and again and again. 
Sakic was eventually found guilty of killing or condoning the killing of more than 2,000 Serbs, Jews and Gypsies. He was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment, the maximum penalty available at the time. The trial judge said his lack of remorse contributed to the length of the sentence. Although interrogated, Nada Sakic never stood trial. For most people, Croatia had finally faced up to its fascist past. In July 2008, Dinko Sakic died in a prison hospital, aged 86. He was no Heinrich Himmler or even Ant Pavelic. He was just a small cog in a big machine. A machine that had given him the power of life and death over thousands of human beings. To the very end of his life, he felt he had no need to apologize to anybody for his actions. The crimes of Dinko Sakic and his Ustasha comrades were committed in the name of the people of Croatia. Even today, there are many of his countrymen and women who believe that Sakic was no war criminal, but a heroic fighter in the cause of freedom for their nation. They believe that his victims, the Serbs, Jews, communists and gypsies, were the real criminals, not Dinko Sakic. In their eyes, Sakic's collaboration with the Nazis was in defense of their nation and the holy Catholic faith. Dinko Sakic's remains are held here, in the main cemetery in central Zagreb. At his funeral, the Roman Catholic priest told the mourners that he was proud he had seen Sakic in his coffin, dressed in an Ustasha uniform. He added, every honorable Croat is proud of the name Dinko Sakic. But not every Croat agrees. For many, the Ustasha regime is a brutal and bloody memory of the country's history. A memory that must never be forgotten. Tako da ja o tome pričam kao jednom zlo koje je bio koje se više neće ponoviti jer vjerujem da se više ne može ponoviti tako nešto jer A da onih koji nema to je mi još uvijek živimo i sa onima kojih nema